one that uh, you kind of wonder why, because we don't deal with clean and unclean animals. We know very clearly that uh, we might say that all that regulation has been taken away. Um, New Testament tells us this. So why would we care? Or what does it have to teach us? And of course, the word of God is continual, so it goes on forever, it doesn't change. And there is a truth inside of there that we're going to try to delve on. As I'm driving to church this morning, and I come down Flint's Creek Road, and it's a nice, curving, winding road that runs alongside of Flynn's Creek for some reason. And as you're going through, you see all the trees hanging up over top of the road. So it's kind of this tunnel effect and it's curving and winding and, and you're seeing the beauty of God in creation. I mean, it's, it's all there and you see the creek flowing and it's because the rains have quit a while back, the creek is flowing with clear water. It's not even muddy. And as you go along, you see a couple of uh, deer jumping across the field, and you know you just, you just see this beauty. And as you're going a little bit further, I see there's a flock of sheep. And of course, you're kind of reminded a flock of sheep, well, sheep the, with the Lamb of God, and it just kind of brings that to mind. And as I'm going along a little bit further, um, what do I see? But there's this uh, rabbit on the road that has been ran over, and the vultures are coming down on it. Okay, so you, you see the ugliness the, the, that, that is also in this world. And as you go a little bit further, you see this real nice um, landscape uh, residence, you know, I see with a barn, and, and it looks real good. And you see that there is nice things that man can bring to this world. You go a little bit further and uh, you see this uh, single wide trailer that's been there since 1947. Um, and the yard hasn't been mowed since then either. And you see man can also bring ugliness to this world. So as I'm driving along a little bit farther and then um, we see there's a cemetery. And I come past this cemetery and I'm kind of reminded of this, you know, there is a death that is coming in this world. You know, man does not live forever, but also, I'm reminded of all of those that have gone before us. The people that have kept alive the gospel message, that they've shared it from generation to generation. And I see these things that I'm just reminded that I'm part of that line. And I gotta be faithful in what I do. And as I come to the end of the journey and I'm coming around the curve over here, and there is Sunlight Church. What am I, I've gone through all of these, I've seen all these reminders and it brings me to where? To the house of God. This is what Leviticus 11 teaches us. How to see. Starting off, what made an animal clean or unclean? We gotta go back to Genesis. In Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17, And the Lord commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat it you shall surely die. Now of all the trees in the garden, God said you may eat, except for this one. Now, you say, well, why this one? The, the fruit of the tree, a little bit Eve said it looked good. I mean, it, it was desirous. Why this one? And it really comes down to a simple answer, because God said so. Okay? That really is what it was. God said, this is what you have. I've given you all of this, but you may not touch this one. It didn't mean that that particular tree in its, of itself was evil. The disobedience is where it was the evil. But God doesn't just do things arbitrarily. He always has a reason for what he does. So let's look at why. So why did God say so? When it comes to the clean and the unclean animals, why did God make a distinction between them? Okay, so First and foremost, I think, that the children of Israel would be a separate people from the other nations around them. And separate how? Well, you start building relationships with neighbors. 
your neighbors who are unbelievers and you have certain things that you might say as a believer that you will not participate in. For the children of Israel it was the same. This was a way to keep that group separate from the world because the neighbors in their world would have eaten what was considered unclean food. So you couldn't go there for a meal and become really close friends. You also would see how they would use these things to make idols. They would make idols out of cows. They would make idols out of birds. Uh, so God said, okay, we've got a, a young group of people here. They're young as far as the world is concerned. And they need to be separate because I have a plan, a special plan for the Jews. This plan is going to be carried all the way through to where the Messiah comes. So they have to stay separate. So they're going to be separate in their daily lifestyle. How they live, how they act, they're going to be a different people. But that really is no different today. We should be a different people than the people of the world. They were reminded that not only did God create the beauty around him, but also the good. Because if they would see, they would see the clean animals. And they would see the goodness that came from them. And they would realize that God is providing them with comfort, with substance, with beauty. You can't recognize beauty if you don't recognize ugly. See, you have to have both. There has to be a comparison. They would be reminded of how detestable sin is. Remember the vultures on the road? If I am reminded that this is a picture of sin in the sight of God, and it's detestable. I mean, have you ever seen a bunch of turkey vultures getting down on something? It's not something you did the desire to join in with. You have a desire to stay far away from. This is what God is teaching us in, with sin. It's something that we desire to stay away from. And then, there, of course, there was the other practical side. Many of the unclean animals carried diseases. Well, pork has a tendency to carry diseases far more than beef does. But there also was the clean animals were actually more nutritious. And generally, you were going to find that the clean animals were vegetarians. And the unclean animals ate animals. It's, it almost follows that pattern. But it wasn't all this dietary stuff that was important. It was two things. It was the obedience to what God said. And it was for their benefit without even realizing it. In the way that they would be separated from the world. So verses 1 and 2, the Lord spoke again to Moses and to Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, These are the creatures which you may eat from all the animals that are on the earth. So of all the animals on the earth, I'm going to give you the ones that you may eat from. See, it starts off, it's interesting, it starts off with the claim. Because this is the beginning, this is where we start at. We start off clean. And then the unclean comes in. Verse 3, whatever divides the hoof, thus making split hoofs, and choose the cut among the animals, that you may eat. So, okay, if it's got these two characteristics about this animal, those are clean. That's how you distinguish. But it's all teaching a little bit more. It's how we see things, how we understand things, that we have to look for certain aspects in life that are good and recognize certain aspects that are not good. So these are the clean animals that could be eaten. Now, verses 4 through 6, nevertheless you are not to eat of these among those which chew the cud and among those which divide the hoof, the camel. For though it chews the cud, it does not divide the hoof. It is unclean to you. Likewise, the saffron. For though it chooses its cut, it does not divide the hoof. It is unclean to you. The rabbit also. For though it chooses its cud, it does not divide the hoof. It is unclean to you. Now, it's interesting that we had clear direction on this first group. 
Now the second group is almost kind of a crossover group, like it's partially clean and partially not. What does that teach us? It teaches us that if there are things in our life that we're not sure about, maybe it's good to abstain from these things, just out of an abundance of caution. See, the ones that were clean were clear. The ones that were unclean here on this list are not so clear. So it's kind of the almost clean, but then again, almost not sinning is still sinning. Then it's reclassifying sin, making it look acceptable. There's a writing in 1 Samuel 15, 15, Saul said, they have brought them from the Malachites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but the rest we have utterly destroyed. Now, God had told Samuel to tell King Saul, you are to go to the Amalekites and you are to slaughter them completely, including all of their cattle, all of their sheep, all of their animals, everything. Of course, Saul doesn't do this, but he comes back with this excuse. The people decided to save the best. And then why did they save the best? Oh, so that we can sacrifice them to your God. He didn't even say to his God. He said to your God. I'm going to do these things. I have heard people say, I play the lottery because one of these days I'm going to hit it big and I'm going to give the money to God like God needs you to win the lottery or I'm going to do this and I'm going to give to God I'm going to, I'm going to do this thing I, you know, people come with all kinds of excuses on how they're going to do something and they're going to give God something out of it the almost claim the almost right no there is no borderline there is straightforward truth and untruth, clean and unclean. In Isaiah 5, verse 20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. See, it's when we take what is wrong, we try to make it something good. We try to make excuses for it. God is saying, whoa, no, you hold on a minute. You can't change what's evil and make it good. You can't do that. Obedience is what I want. Modern day sins, things like little white lies, you know, the ones that really don't hurt anybody, you know, um, disrespect for others, for parents, you know, failing to discipline children, unfaithful in service to God. That's, that's a faithfulness. Okay, I, I do this, I don't do that, uh, you know. Any of, one of us that are honest with ourselves will admit that our service to God is not 100%. I said that for myself also. I'm not there. But do I want to? Do I desire to? Do I look for things in how I can serve? Or do I try to avoid it? Do I try to stay away from it? And then simple things that the world has taken evil and turned it into good. Homosexuality, sex outside of marriage, Darwinism, all of these things that the world has taken and said, no, there's nothing wrong with that. Scripture clearly states that these are sins. And for us to say, that, to agree, and I've heard many Christians take some of these things and say, oh, maybe it's okay. No, it splits the hoof, but it doesn't chew the cud. Or it chews the cud and it doesn't split the hoof. It can't be almost good. It's either good or it's bad. It's either righteous or it's evil. Verse 7 and 8, 
and the pig, for though it divides the hoof, thus making it a split hoof, it does not chew its cud, it is unclean to you. You shall not eat of the flesh, nor touch their carcass, they are unclean to you. It takes the pig and makes it really clear, it is unclean. But then again, we don't think of a pig and a clean. The two are not synonymous with each other. But it also says, you don't even touch it. In other words, the things that are evil, stay away from them. Don't even get close. In Joshua 7:21, when I saw, and this is the sin of Achan, when the Israelites are coming to the promised land and they attack Jericho and the walls fell down, and God had said, everything in here belongs to me. God was establishing something again. He comes first. So everything in that first city was owned by God. It was to be given back to him. And I saw the spoil of a beautiful mantle from Shinar, and 200 shekels of silver, and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight. Then I coveted them, and I took them. And behold, they are concealed on the earth inside my tent with a silver underneath it. Achan had stuck up these things. He had taken them to his tent. He was hiding them. We don't hide sins from God. And he paid a severe penalty for it because he and his family were destroyed because of it. In 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, with self -control, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. There's a whole list here, and it really comes down to, I deserve this mindset. They use it in commercials even. They're saying, I deserve to have this. I deserve to do this. I deserve happiness in my life. God wants me to be happy, doesn't he? So whatever makes me happy must be good. The problem is what makes me happy too often is sinful and it's not good until I find joy. Okay, there's a huge difference because what gives me joy is a relationship with Jesus Christ. I want beyond happy. I want joy. Verse 9. These you may eat whatever is in the water, all that have fins and scales, those in the water, in the seas or in the rivers you may eat. This is the list of clean fish. Now, for us today, that's home would be kind of a bummer because there goes the catfish. It's one of these, I'm grateful that there was a change that took, took a place. Verse 10, but whatever is in the seas and the rivers does not have fins and scales among all the teeming of life water and among all the living creatures that are in the water, they are detestable things to you. Again, kind of a list, but that list for us today is a different list. That's right. That would, be a, that would be a problem. But it's teaching us to recognize sin. It's teaching us to recognize that there are things that are good and there are things that are evil. And for us to be looking for them. Okay. That's next. It's not in this list. It's actually in the list of Deuteronomy, but it's not in this list. Okay, it's not in this list. No. Nope. Because I, I know that you can eat certain birds, right. but other birds you can't. But in this list, I can see it. Nope. Possible. It's not. Um, but like I said, there, there, is, there are other lists in Deuteronomy um, that does list it. I do. I've seen 
<laughs> Verses 13 through 19. These moreover you shall detest among the birds. They are at horrid. Not to be eaten, the eagle, the vulture, the buzzard, and the kite, and the falcon of its kind, every raven in its kind, and the ostrich, and the owl, and the seagull, and the hawk in its kind, and the little owl, and the comorat, and the great owl, and the white owl, and the pelican, and the carrion vulture, and the stork, and the heron in its kind, and the hoopy, and the bat. These were a whole list of birds that were unclean. I find it fascinating that in this list, there's the raven. Now there is another passage that talks about a raven. That's 1 Kings 17, verses 3 and 4. And it says it was Elijah. Go away from here and turn it eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. It shall be that you will drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to provide you for you there. Now isn't it fascinating that there's this list of unclean birds? Elijah, prophet of God, is in hiding and God takes an unclean bird to bring food to his prophet. Because the bird itself is not evil. It is a symbol of but also for Elijah, it was a great symbol because here this unclean bird was bringing him food. In other words, God is providing from people that don't even realize they're helping out the people of God. Yeah. But the world, the world provides for things for us and they don't realize that they're helping us. But God uses everything that goes on for the benefit of his people. He is controlling, he is even controlling the evil. Verses 20 through 23, all the winged insects that walk on all fours are detestable to you. Yet these you may eat among the winged insects that walk on all fours, those which are above their feet and joint legs which jump on the earth. These of them you may eat, the locust in its kind, and the devastating locust in its kind, the cricket in its kind, the grasshopper in its kind. But all the other winged insects which are four-footed are detestable to you. In other words, even with the bugs, there's good. We think of bugs as bad, always bad. But do we think of things that are going on in our lives, the things that bug us, that irritate us. And sometimes that irritation is a good thing because it steers us in the right direction. We're not wanting to go the right way, but something comes along and just bugs us and forces us that way thankful for the bugs. Not all bugs. There are things that should bug us that are bad. But there are things that bug us that are pro Grasshoppers especially are fairly commonly ate. See, now it comes to the next set we're looking at, discernment. <laughs> In Jude, chapter 1, which is only got one chapter, but verses 17 through 23, but you, beloved, ought to remember the words that are spoken beforehand by the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you at the last time there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lust. These are the ones that cause divisions, worldly minded, devoid of the spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, learning to discern. And this is what Leviticus 11 is teaching us. We have this list of clean, we have this list of unclean. Now the list, of the unclean and the clean in and of themselves are not holy and evil. They're birds, they're animals, they're insects. In and of themselves they are not evil. Or in and of themselves they are not good. But they are to bring to mind that there is good and there is evil in this world. And we are to have a discernment on knowing which is which.
The only way we can discern is by knowing the Word of God being taught to us by the Holy Spirit. That gives us discernment. Verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others as snatching them out of the fire. And on, have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. So keep ourselves in the love of God. We must hold ourselves in that, knowing that that love of God will keep us, will sustain us. Continuing on in Acts, a voice came to him, get up, people, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Again, the voice came a second time, what God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. See, this was the time when God had made it abundantly clear that this whole concept of the ritual of clean and unclean animals had been done away with. But it was teaching us a whole lot more. Because, did you see that last line? What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. God has cleansed us. We are no longer unholy. That's true cleansing. That true cleansing came from Christ. The whole concept of being washed in the blood. What may have been considered unholy before is no longer. Because we were unholy. We were sinful. It was our nature. It's who we were. But we've been cleansed. Continuing on in Acts, verse 28. And he said to him, You yourselves know how un it is unlawful for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. See, this goes back. Remember when I've talked about the reasoning that God said you separate, the Israelites separate from the nations around them? It had carried through to this day or to that day. They did not eat with other people. A Jew would not eat with somebody who was not a Jew. That had been so instilled and ingrained in them that even when they became Christians, they thought that they were supposed to keep separated. But then the, the Spirit came to Peter and said, no, that regulation is gone. Because what God has made holy, no matter if it's a Jew or a Gentile, it is now holy. Continue on in Acts. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who were listening to the message. And all the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed. Because a gift of the Holy Spirit had been given, poured out on the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit, just as we did. Can he? The Gentiles, which is us, are welcomed in. We're welcomed into that body. That body that was primarily reserved for the Jews. That all changed. That all changed when Christ paid the penalty for sin. And it all changed the way that we look at things. All these regulations regarding eating this or not eating that are gone. They've been taken away. That's why we can enjoy catfish. Okay. And shrimp. And pork. I mean, bacon. You know, bacon. I mean, come on. Um, but all of those don't mean anything anymore in and of themselves. And even in and of themselves back then, they weren't good or bad in and of themselves. But they were to become reminders. And those we still need. We still need reminders of what is good and what is bad. It's trying to change everything. We need to be f firm and true to what is evil. Not let the world tell us what's right and wrong. But the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, tells us what's right and wrong. So 
So next time you're driving down Flint's Creek Road, look for the symbols. All the reminders are there. And you can do that pretty much on any other road in the area. Look for the good. Recognize the evil.